A little bit about me. So you might not know who I am. I grew up in this uh, place called Dubai. It's not part of Illinois. I was once asked that. <laughs> um, it's actually part of the Middle East. Uh, it's in this country called the United Arab Emirates. And um, uh, this is what it looked like when I was 10. So now you know how old I am. <laughs> so um, just stare at the screen for a minute. This is uh, 1991. This is 2005. Now, look at those four buildings right there. Those haven't changed, okay? Whoa. So if, hopefully you're drinking and this looks really cool. You can just go back and forth a few times. Um, so why am I showing this to you? The reason I'm showing this to you is because in a very short span of time, we can actually transform our environment really, really quickly. I mean, this is amazing technology, amazing innovation, amazing engineering. It's also, to me, uh, growing up here, um, it's very difficult to sort of look at this and uh, sort of wonder where did the desert go, you know? What happened to my landscape? And so uh, they're building ski resorts in the middle of the desert. There are three so far, more are designed to be built. This is, what it's gonna, this is what it's gonna look like. So it's kind of like an oil to ice conversion. Um, this is sort of a, a, the palm resort, resorts that you know, everyone gets beach access. I mean, who doesn't love the beach? Um, so this is a photograph I took, and this was actually my last visit to the UAE. I, it's very difficult for me to actually go back because it doesn't feel, doesn't look like the place that I grew up in. And so this is a photograph that I took from the shore of a ship dumping sand into the ocean to make land. And this is how the, the, the sort of the shoreline has transformed over time. This is 1973, 1990, and 2006. So do you see the Palm Islands and the World Islands? It's pretty amazing, right? So in a very, very short period of time, the entire environment has completely transformed itself. And so this is where I grew up. This is my background. Um, so I came to the United States in 2000, and I was at UIUC, who there's some alums. Uh, we went to school together, and they found me here, which is amazing. <laughs> what? Um, so, did, uh, so I studied physics and math, and I was like, all right, uh, physics is amazing, but I really wanted to work on climate change. I really wanted to work on sustainability. The United Arab Emirates has like a very high, large environmental footprint. So does the United States. And so the year that I started my PhD was 2004. So I'm sort of giving you the story of my life and then I'm gonna embed that into the story of the work that I'm doing. So in 2004, the, the, the same month that I started my PhD, this paper came out in Science Magazine by Pakala and Sokolo. And like their first sentence in their paper was, all right, humanity already has all of the solutions we need to solve the climate problem. We don't have to wait, we have the technology we need, we can solve it today. So, Humanity already, possess, already has all of these solutions, so then why haven't we done anything about it? Um, we still have this problem happening right now. Um, so what did they say in their paper? So they said, all right, this was sort of a, a back of the envelope exercise that they did. So they said, all right, if we want to stabilize emissions and then we want to stabilize concentration, let's just think about it in terms of a variety of technologies, a variety of things we can do. So they said, all right, imagine each of these technologies providing a wedge, a, a sort of a one gigaton uh, of carbon decrease per year, everything from efficiency and conservation, renewable electricity, carbon capture and storage, for, like reforestation, nuclear energy, biomass, fuel switching, so on and so forth. And this is just to stabilize emissions. And then after that, we need to actually decrease our emissions um, to net removal. So they sort of put forward this entire portfolio. I said, great. Why aren't we doing that stuff? Um, and what they also said in their paper is, improvements in efficiency and conservation offer the greatest potential to solve this problem. So I started dedicating my entire career from then, from that point on, to figuring out why is it that we don't um, incorporate efficiency and conservation in our life. And I've been focusing primarily in the United States. So what's been going on? Um, as you can tell, uh, our carbon dioxide concentration, which is basically how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere, has been going steadily up. So it just keeps increasing every year. So every year that I teach my course, I have to keep updating the numbers. They keep going up. And it's like, that, every time I teach that, that one section of my class, it's like internal pain. I have to go home and have, my, have myself a, a nice gin and tonic at the end of the day. It's like, you know, how do we solve this? So um, 
when Al Gore sort of uh, uh, came up with the inconvenient truth, he was trying to keep it under 400 parts per million. So just as percent is out of 100, parts per million is out of a million. So we're trying to keep this at below doubling, and we've just passed 400 parts per million. So that is the challenge that we're faced today. So how do you visualize this in terms of temperature? So this is a beautiful graphic that Ed Hawkins did. It's basically a color map looking at what does the average temperature look like in the United States, and each stripe is one year. So as you can tell, if you just squint from the back of the room, it's kind of going from bluish to reddish, right? The folks at the back of the room, do you see that? So that's basically what's happening with our um, average annual temperature. Uh, so we're getting warmer. So, in trying to figure out why we don't act, I actually asked 700 people across the United States, hey, what is the single most important problem for you today? What is the single most important problem for you in the future? And what do you think is the world's problem today and in the world's problem in the future? And here is the data, and this is data I collected in 2010. So the most number one problem that America faces today is the economy, all right? The number one problem that the world faces in the future is climate change. So the problem there is that the future always happens in the future. <laughs> how do we speed that shit up? <laughs> um, so how do we make the future happen today? And that's why I'm sort of really interested in stories and storytelling. I'm really interested in how do we compress time? How do we make time? Like, how do we imagine what the future is going to look like today?